Well, greetings, Central, wherever you are. It is a pleasure to welcome you to our services this weekend. I don't know if you're here on Thursday night. I don't know if you're here uh, watching it on Saturday night online. If you're on one of our campuses on Sunday, uh, I don't know if you're watching it during the week. I don't know when you're seeing this, but this is a crazy, crazy week around here. We are switching out a whole bunch of equipment on our broadcast campus, which is Gilbert. And so I'm actually pre-recording this message to an empty room. So if it sounds weird or looks weird, uh, it's just kind of what's happening. I'm actually going to be with a whole bunch of men uh, this weekend from our church uh, at Elevate. And so uh, it's a men's conference and I hope you're there. But however you're seeing this, whenever you're seeing it, man, it's really, really good to have you with us. Hey, so why don't you do this? Go ahead and open your Bibles to Acts chapter four. Uh, we're going to be there in just a moment as soon as I get a chance to set some things up. Now, huh, you probably know this about me. I don't think it's going to come as a surprise, but I am a preacher. Uh, obviously, uh, being a preacher uh, does not have a good connotation in our culture these days. And, and, and so when I introduce myself, um, I, I'm very well aware of this. So I don't introduce myself. I don't lead a conversation. Hey, I'm a preacher. Uh, it tends to kill conversation. But I need you to understand something. I, I'm really proud of what I do. And I, I've loved the life that I've lived. And, and I feel very privileged to get to be a preacher, as weird as that might sound to you. Well, what I love most about being a preacher, and you maybe have never thought about this, but I get to do what Jesus did. I get to do the very thing that Jesus, Jesus got to talk to people all the time about God, and I get to do that. I get to use words and ideas and illustrations. I guess you could say this, I'm practicing an art that's been in our family for like 2,000 years. Uh, my great, 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 you get the idea, man, way back. Uh, so I, I love getting to do this. It's quite the legacy. But what is so cool about getting to do what Jesus did was Jesus was so good at what he did. Uh, he just set an incredible tone and it was a fantastic preacher. I don't know if you know this about him, but he was. Well, but I want to just ponder for a moment. What made him such a good preacher? You maybe have never thought about this, but I want you to think about it right now. Jesus told profound truths in very simple ways. You have maybe never considered this, but I've studied this and I think it's fascinating. He's, he's very profound truths in very simple ways. You, you could say it this way. He preached simply. Uh, so many preachers don't preach simply. He, he didn't use big words and, and, and he didn't go on and on and, and you know, try to confuse people. He, he would just make it so simple. He, he told us about a broad road and a narrow road. It, we was talking about heaven. Uh, one road leads to heaven, one road leads to hell. I, I get that. I can understand that. He, he talked about uh, weeds uh, among wheat and, 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 and sheep and goats. And it was using illustrations of just common things to explain uh, like, uh, you know, at the end of time, uh, some are going to go to heaven, some are going to go to hell. And he was just explaining that and, and just explaining the difference about these people that, you know, we kind of all live here, but we get different destinations. I get that. I can understand that. Uh, he teaches truths about God. He's used the most common things. He, he, he would talk about things like, you know, uh, he would talk about clouds and he would make truth about clouds, He'd sp about sparrows and about lilies. And he would talk about light and darkness. I get that. I understand this. He was a master communicator because he, in fact, let me just put it in, let me show it to you. Hear the statement. He, Jesus used simple things to explain significant truths. And I love the fact that he did that because I, I'll tell you what, I get that. I get it. So I, I want to, I want to just take you on a quick journey. Now that I've explained that, let me, let me just take you back in time. Do you remember being a kid and remember going to school and having to show and tell? You remember the process of show and tell? It was your turn. You're going to bring something, something cool. And uh, you, you'd hide it and then you'd bring it and then you'd bring it out and reveal it to the class. And uh, if they didn't uh, know what it was, uh, you, you, you let them guess, what do you think this is? And then, and then you finally just find words to explain uh, what it is that you brought. Now you're just a kid, you didn't have anything really complicated, but you got to, you got to make uh, an application of something as you would tell them about what this is. And uh, that kind of idea is uh, what I wanna take you right now. I wanna, I wanna show you something, I wanna tell you about it. I, I want to. I want to show you this. You, you, you. As soon as I show you this, you go. I know what that is. It's obvious what that is. That, that there's no big secret to that. Uh, it's, it's a salt shaker, right? It's a salt shaker, and, and folks, uh, it's exactly what it is. It, it is a, a salt shaker. Any guesses what's inside the salt shaker? Of course, you know what's inside the salt shaker. It's, it's a salt shaker. It's got salt inside it. You, you know what this is used for? 
Of course, you know what it's used for. It's for distributing salt. It shakes salt out. It's kind of not that different. Now, I'm really glad that this exists because I'm one of these people. I like salt. Not as much as my wife does, but I like salt. I, I like putting salt on things. Uh, can, can you imagine the experience of having, uh, I don't know, a, a, a bowl of popcorn and, and you're eating it, but it's not got any salt on it. Can you even imagine? I mean, even just describing it sounds really, really bland. Uh, not the least bit interesting at all. Everything tastes better with salt. Everybody knows that. Everybody loves salt. It's just it's a common thing. It's all, you see it everywhere. It's all around us. But, but what I want to explain what salt does best is it creates a reaction. That's what it does. It creates a reaction. In fact, let me just say it as a truth. If it's salt, it'll create a reaction. If there's no reaction, it's not salt. That, just kind of hold on to that thought for just a moment. Uh, if it's salt, it's going to create a reaction. Now, I want to show you something that maybe you never really thought about. In our little show and tell, I want to tell you something about salt. Salt's a lot like people. I I'm going to go down a road here. You maybe don't ever think about this, but you know what I know about salt? Salt likes to hang out with its same kind. Salt likes to be with salt. I mean, that, that shaker, if there was anything other than salt in that shaker, it would stand out and be really weird. Salt loves to hang out with salt. It loves to stay with its own kind. You know, people are just like that, aren't we? We like to hang out with people who are just like us, and we just kind of get in this thing. Um, you, you could say that, you know, salt comforts uh, salt. Uh, salt likes being around other salt crystals. It's kind of how that works. Um, because they don't even get, they don't get along with pepper. So you got to have a whole separate container for pepper. I mean, you got salt here, you got pepper. You in this corner, you in that corner. Salt, you know, it doesn't even want to be with the other most common item. There's safety in numbers and salt just goes, you know what? I'm most comfortable when I'm just hanging out with others just like me. And, and that's my purpose is to hang out in a salt shaker and be there. But you know, that's not the purpose. Here's the problem. Salt will never be effective in a, an assault shaker. It is never going to do what it was designed to do if all it does is hang out with itself inside a container. It's never useful when it just hangs out with its own. So let me put in these words. For impact to be made, contact has to be initiated. For it to make any difference on popcorn, it's got to get out of there and get on the popcorn. It's got to come in contact with the popcorn if it doesn't come in contact. It's got to experience something other than itself to have any impact, to make any difference. Salt never improves the taste of salt. It never makes salt better. Salt hanging out with itself, never get, it never gets any. But, but when it's in contact with other things, it can do great things. So I guess you could say that at best, the salt shaker, uh, it, it's an illustration of the potential impact of something. Uh, it, it's the potential impact of the difference it can make on the taste of food. And it does a number of other things, which I won't take the time to go into. Um, it, could you call it a salt shaker if it never shakes salt out? I mean, if never, if all the salt is always in there, could you, can you stop calling it a salt shaker if it never does anything but hold salt? But okay, now I'm just digressing. Let me get back on here. It has the potential to make a huge difference. And when it gets out of its container, huddling with itself, it can make a huge, huge difference. I want <clears throat> to share with you a couple of things that Jesus said. And, and I'm going to show you a, a number of things today. And I'm going to go very, very quickly because I got some ground I want to cover. I want to show you something before we're done. I want to just tell you a couple of things that Jesus said. I want to remind you of some things. You probably have heard this, okay? Matthew 5.13, and you don't need to look these up um, right now. Uh, again, in your Bible, uh, Acts chapter 4 is where we're going to be in just a second. So just hold there. But let me just, I'll bring them up on the screen. Let me show you some things that Jesus said. In Matthew 5, 13, he said this, you, you, believer, disciple, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. See, salt can become worthless and useless and, and lose its effect. How, the greatest way it loses its effect is if it just stays in a salt shaker, that's one thing Jesus said. Let me tell you something else Jesus said. Now, again, you should be very familiar with this. Matthew 28, we know it is a great commission, the last words of Jesus before he ascended. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations. You know this. 
baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. So he basically said, um, hey, hey, uh, disciple, hey, follower, I want you to go. Let me translate. I don't want you hanging out with yourself in the container. I want you to go and I want you to make disciples and I want you to teach and I want you to make a difference. But get out. Go is what he said. In, in Matthew uh, 9.37, it says that he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. What, what, what do you mean? We got all kinds of salt. Here's the problem. Salt likes staying in the salt shaker. It doesn't want to get out. It's uncomfortable to get out of the comfort and the confines of being around other crystals that are just like you, other crystals just like you. So what Jesus was saying is there's a way to make a difference, but very few are actually making a difference. You see, let me say it to you this way. To, to make a difference in this world, we're going to have to make contact with some people in this world. We're going to have to touch some people in this world. We're going to have to uh, not just hang out with ourselves, but we actually need to come into the presence of people, engage people who are not like us. And because they're not like us, maybe they won't even like us. That's a risky thing, man. I, I don't know, man. They might not receive me very well. Because they're not like us, they are going to have a reaction to us because we're different than them because we're salt and they're not. They're not and, but we're supposed to touch them and make a difference. Let me say it this way, to make a difference, we must leave the comfort of the salt shaker and come in contact with those who are different than us. And when we do this, especially if we do it boldly, like we've been talking about, I think incredible things happen. Now, <clears throat> let's jump in. Uh, let's just do a quick rewind of where we were last week. My friend Trevor, pastor at Pantano Christian Church, taught last weekend. And let me just kind of remind you. And I, I, I need you to understand right now, I'm going to do a Bible blitz, which means I'm going to throw a lot of Bible at you. It's going to come at you very quickly. If you have a Bible open, Acts chapter 4, you can follow. But um, if, you, if you don't take this week's message in context, you're not going to get anything out of this week's message. You've got you to understand how it fits, all right? Uh, the, the, the way to read the Bible is not in little bite-sized chunks, like a verse at a time. It's to understand the context, the flow, the narrative. And so we're going to do that. So let me just remind you about what Trevor talked. He, he was talking about something that happened in Acts chapter 3 about a, a, a lame man that was a beggar that was healed. And uh, man, this guy got healed and uh, he was jumping up and down. He was going crazy. He was causing all kinds of commotion and uh People were watching, and, and, and so you get into Acts chapter 4, and you start to realize now the tension is coming because this guy is running around, jumping around, praising God and, and praising Jesus. And so let me, let me read to you, and I'll read very quickly. Let me just catch you up, okay? So this is what happened last week. Um, so in Acts chapter 4, verses 1 to 4, it says this. Uh, the priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. And they seized Peter and John because it was evening. They put them in jail uh, until the next day. But many who heard about, uh, heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. It was 3,000 and then five, it's growing, it's taking off. You see, Peter and John got out from amongst their own and came in contact with people who were different. And this uh, blind or this lame guy, uh, man, he, he, he made contact with the people of God and his life was just transformed. In Acts chapter four, a little farther down, 18, this is a review. Uh, they, then they called them in again, the Peter and John, and commanded them not to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes to listen to you or, or to him, to Jesus? Um, you be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let him go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. This guy had been this way for his entire life and now he's walking around. What are you going to do? See, it's hard to deny or nullify or quiet a transformed life. So Jesus said in his great commission, I want you to go and I want you to uh, teach people and, and baptize people, which means you're going to have to go out from the comfort of being hanging out with yourself and people just like you. And I want you to come into contact with people who think differently than you do. Now we jump into Acts chapter uh, five 
Acts chapter 5, and, and, and I, actually, I'm going to work our way through this because there's so much in here to see, and I'm going to go very, very quick, but just follow this. Acts chapter 5, we picked the story up in verse 17. It, it says, Then the high priest and all of his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, these are all the religious, Jewish religious leaders of a particular sect, um, the Sadducees, well, they were filled with jealousy. Jealousy over what? Over the commotion that Jesus in this guy's life was making and that he was praising Jesus. They were uncomfortable. They were getting all the press. Uh, they arrested the apostles again and put them in the public jail. Now, during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, they entered the temple courts as they had been told, and they began to teach the people. You see, the leaders, the religious leaders, threw him in jail and he said, you stop talking. But, but they were under orders from Jesus to tell people, to go and tell people. And then an angel appeared and said, what are you doing here? Well, they threw us in here. Well, get out, go out and tell people about Jesus. That's the deal here. So it's just fascinating. Uh, it's a classic tension going on here because the question is going to be, what are they going to do? They're being told to stifle the message. Jesus said, don't stifle, get out and tell people. Let's pick it up in Acts 21, uh, 521. Uh, when the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin. Now this is the ruling, this is the Supreme Court of Israel. The full assembly of the elders, all the elders of Israel. And they sent to the jail for the apostles. Now they don't understand, they're out. They don't know this yet. Uh, but they're like, they think they're in charge and that they're going to uh, they're going to prosecute these men for speaking about Jesus and turning Jerusalem upside down. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there for they went back and reported. Well, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when he opened them, we found no one inside. Well, I don't know where they went. They broke out somehow. Something incredible happened on hearing this report. The captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss. That's an understatement wondering what this might lead to. And then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple courts teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They, they, they did not use force because they feared that the people would stone him. Hey, we told you to stay quiet. We told you to quit telling people about Jesus. And here we find you. Now there's all kinds of mystery. How'd you get out here? What happened here? Now jump down to Acts 5, 27 and 28. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this, in this man's name, in his name. He said, yet you have filled with Jerusalem with your teaching and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. This is powerful. Everyone's talking about this now. We told you to stifle it. Now you've been out telling, everyone knows and what are we gonna do? And now you're trying to, Pin this uh, Jesus crucifixion on us. Well, I need to understand the charge made against him is we told you to be quiet, but God told us to speak. And now you're filling Jerusalem. So you just understand again. So you're going to listen to when God's telling you to do one thing, but others are telling you to do something else. It's a, it's a crisis, isn't it? Look down in verses 33 to 40. So what are we going to do? Uh, when they heard this, the Sanhedrin, uh, you told us to be quiet, but God told you, okay. They were furious and they wanted to put him to death. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was honored by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and he ordered that the men be put outside for a little while. Then he addressed the Sanhedrin, men of Israel. Consider carefully what you intend to do to these men. Now, sometime Theodius appeared, claiming to be somebody, and about 400 men rallied to him and he was, he was killed. And after... Uh, that all his followers were dispersed and it all came to nothing. After him, Judas the Galilean appeared in the days of the census and led a band of people in revolt and he too was killed and his followers were scattered. Therefore, in the present case, I advise you, leave these men alone, let them go. They're, they're followers of Jesus, but th these other guys were killed just like Jesus was killed and it came to nothing. I wouldn't make a scene here. And they said this, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them going, that's smart. You're right. If this is of God, you're not going to be able to stop it. It's, it can't be of God. And so we need to back off. Now watch this. Uh, but if uh, <clears throat> you will not be able to stop these men, you will only find yourselves fighting against God. His speech persuaded them. They called the apostles in 
and have them flogged. Don't miss that line. Have them flogged. Then they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then let them go. They beat them up. They whipped them. And we need you to understand the religious leaders, their first intention was to kill them. And they didn't kill them. They settled for just beating them. You see, uh, kill them just like they killed Jesus. Just eliminate the threat. Let me show you how the story ends. This is Acts 5, 41 and 42. It's the conclusion. The apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing, not whining, not crying, not whimpering, rejoicing because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name of Jesus. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. Folks, you got to understand what's going on here. These people will not be shut up. They will not be silenced. They will not be intimidated. This boldness that we've been talking about is this incredible thing that happens when the Spirit of God gets in you and you quit fighting against it and you let God do what God wants to do. Now, I want to make sure we all understand what we're talking about here. We're talking about here that a word uh, that sums it all up is the word persecution. Persecution. The Jewish leaders, religious leaders of Jesus' day, uh, persecuted the early church. They were threatened by the early church. And while persecution can be subtle or it can be obvious, there was nothing subtle about what they were doing and the way they treated these people. And actually they mistreated these people. So let me make sure we understand. Let me just give us a working definition of persecution. What is persecution? Let me, from a dictionary. Persecution is the systematic mistreatment of an individual or group by another individual or group. Uh, to treat others or uh, an other uh, someone, a particular cruelly or unfairly because of race, religious, or political beliefs. Well, why, why does persecution happen? Why, why did persecution, so in, in this, they, these men came after these followers of Jesus, Peter and John, it says be, because they were, they, they were jealous. They, there, there was an effect happening as the salt that these men represented was impacting the culture and they, they didn't care for it. Persecution comes as a result of being threatened by the presence or the claims of someone else. Let, let me give you the big idea that we'll just wrestle with for the next few moments. The intent of persecution is always to silence, to intimidate, or to eliminate the threat. Persecution is always about feeling threatened, not the person who's being persecuted, but the person who instigates persecution, there's something, they're threatened by something. Now we could say there's two kinds of persecutions that we could talk about. We could talk about the persecution that um, comes at us from non-believers and then we also got to talk about the persecution that comes at you if you're trying to do what Jesus said because of religious leaders, because that's what happened here in, in our story. So we can't skip that. The, the message that I'm wrestling with you right now uh, is, is the idea of, of, of loving beyond, because that's the series that we're in, loving beyond. And, and this particular message is loving beyond by developing grit. What is grit? Grit is you, uh, unwillingness to quit a tenacity that stays after it. You see why grit is needed. Jesus said to speak, but you're going to encounter those who demand silence, uh, possibly in the workplace, but very often in religious circles. You and I are going to have to make a choice, just like these guys had to choose. You decide whether you're going to listen to man or God. You're going to have to sort that out. Grit is the willingness and the ability to persevere when the temptation is to be intimidated. Grit is staying after it. Now, let's get real personal. H have you uh, been persecuted for your faith? A and if so, how? How frequently have you been persecuted if you have? How severely? You know, it's fascinating in America, we have the freedom to share anything we want to share with anyone about Jesus. We have freedom to talk about our faith, yet many of us choose not to. We just don't. W why? Well, it was fear. Fear of what? Fear of being threatened by getting flogged, by having somebody we love 
threatened and taken out by somebody taking our life? Is that what quiets us down? That's not what quiets us. You know what quiets us down? The fear of rejection, the fear of being mocked, the fear of being laughed at, the fear of somehow uh, upsetting people and not... Can, can I show you something from scripture that I think is very important to the subject? 2 Timothy 3.12 says, in fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It, it, it's not, it, you, hey, there's a chance, there's an outside chance, if you think about a 3%, 4% chance, that if you try to live for Jesus, someone's gonna try to get in your way and try to silence you. If we're faithful and we tell people about Jesus, there will be people who will try to shut us up. The uh, intent of persecution, can I remind you of this? The intent of persecution is always to silence, to intimidate, or to eliminate the threat. By non-religious people, by religious people, the question that you have to brace yourself for and, and think through is, what will you do? What will you do? You know, I can't help it as I read this, I was thinking about the dynamics here. As a church, not talking about as a person, as a church, you know, the truth of the matter is we don't really get persecuted too much by non-believers. We, we just don't. When, when non-believers visit our church, they're often surprised, um, kind of caught off guard. They have a far more pleasant experience than they were expecting. They were expected to be judged and they were expected to be condemned and you know, expected to be re rejected. <clears throat> but that doesn't tend to happen. Now, I want to say as a church, I don't think we face much persecution from non-believers. I, I know that I personally don't. I'm, I'm a preacher and I don't face much persecution. I, some, but not much. You know, it's interesting. In surveys that they've taken, they've determined, this is fascinating, only 5% of non-Christians are found to be antagonistic towards a Christian. Only 5% of non-Christians are found to be antagonistic towards a Christian. That's one out of 20. One out of 20. 19 out of 20 are fine with you believing and voicing whatever it is that you believe. Who told us that non-believers are so hostile? But can I tell you where persecution comes from as a church? And I, again, I cannot help but see this. Uh, persecution for as a church has come from religious people who don't want us telling the message that we as a church are telling. And I'm just being vulnerable here. If you were to jump online and you were to go to Yelp or Google, whatever, and read reviews of our church, you'd read positive things, but you know what, you'd, you'd also read negative comments. I mean, there's a bunch of fives, there's also ones. You know what the ones are all about? Well, the first thing I gotta tell you, the ones are from Christians who don't like certain things that this church stands for and they wanna give voice. Now. There's a couple of things I could tell you about, but you know, one is they, you know, it's not uncommon that they would blast us for not being small and that to do what we do, we use video and that, you know, that's a common. But you know, the other thing that they're very vocal about, um, they don't, um, and, and let me, before I tell you, these are from people who uh, present themselves as godly people, just so you know. They, they don't do what Jesus said when somebody's done something to you to talk to them personally. They anonymously will post on, you know, a, a website. They don't approve of the message of this church. And I, I, again, I'm going to tell you what the issue is in just a moment. But can I just tell you what the message of the church that we consistently proclaim is? Let me just fire off some verses and I'll be done here in just a moment. Um, what are the most often repeated verses or truths that you'll hear in this church? Number one, of course, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he sent his son to die for you. I hear that all the time. Uh, Acts 4.16, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given but to mankind by which we must be saved. You'll hear that a lot. Uh, Luke 9.23, of course, uh, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily and follow me, which means you got to deny, die to yourself and follow John 13, 34, talk about this all the time, a new commandment I give you, that uh, you love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. Love must be about the other person being more than you. So Luke 9 tells us it's not about us, and Luke uh, you know, makes it really clear that to follow him means you can't do that. John 13 says, you know, you... 
you sacrifice yourself for the sake of other people. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, you hear this a lot in our church. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, rather in humility, value others above yourself, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. You'll hear that a lot here. And then you'll hear like Luke 6, 27. Now, these are not, these are ideas, but <clears throat> to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies, uh, do good to those who hate you, and bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. So what's the rumpus about? Okay, yeah, so people don't like the fact that we're not small and they want their, you know, they'll voice that. But you know, the second most common thing that we'll get complaints about is we have d decided on this issue of love beyond. We've made our mind up. Love beyond is an incredibly offensive thing to religious people. It implies something that we're not implying. It doesn't mean you love people no matter what they do, no matter anything they do, you know, love, it, it just, you know, everything's okay. We don't ever say that. Like there's no standards, there's no values. We don't ever say that, but love is an attitude. Um, and the tragedy, and let me revisit this idea. Most every Christian I know believes that they've checked the box and they've done everything that God expected them to do. Like in other words, the command was we, we as a church should be loving, we, we should be defined as the most loving environment that people ever come into. And yet the outside world looks at the church and says, Y'all are anything but loving. See, we think we're going to get the pass and the, we've done what God asked. There, there was a poll, I find this fascinating, conducted December of 2021 by Ipsos. They asked religious and non-religious people, what attributes best describe Christians? You ready for this? The response of Christians, what best describes Christians? Ready, ready? 72% of Christians said Christians are loving. 71% said they were compassionate. Saying we are, we are loving, we are compassionate. Um, the virtue of giving was very high. 62% said Christians were respectful. Those are the greatest attributes of Christians, according to Christians. Then they asked non-Christians, when you think of Christians, what do you think of? 55% said Christians were hypocritical. 54% said they were judgmental. 50% said they were self-righteous. Let me read a line that came out of that survey. While significant majorities of evangelical Christians, 71%, and mainline Protestants, 59%, considering themselves as compassionate, only 15% of members of other religious groups and 12% of the non-religious considered Christians in the same way. You know what happens when you see yourself one way, but nobody sees you the same way? It's called being delusional. Jesus said, there's one thing that's going to set you apart is that you love one another. The non-Christian world goes, y'all, you need to listen to him because you're not doing this very well. So we in our church have just determined we're going to find a way to love. We're going to love beyond. We're going to let people know uh, that we are about this and we're going to do that. We say it this way, we'll be known for loving beyond all walls, lines, borders, boundaries, and limits. We're not going to. The problem is, is we want lines and limits. We want Jesus to have said to us is, I just want you to try. I just want you to give it a good try. Try to love people. That's really important. And so we, we bargain with God. We, I'll love God up to a point, And then that's the line that we put out there. I'll love up to a point. If you're the same nationality as I am, I'll, I'll work. I'll, I'll try my hardest to love you. As long as you're on this side of the issue of nationality, I'll love you. If you have the same skin color that I have. If you hold the same values that I hold or have, then I'll love you. If you vote the same way that I vote, if you believe in God just as I do, then I'll love you. What Jesus was saying was, I want you to love beyond the line you want to draw that separates you from them. Well, that's, that's a lot harder. How can we ever make a difference to those who are different than us if we never make contact with those who are different than us? I guess I would, and let me close here. If your faith in Jesus isn't putting you in contact with people who are different than you are, you're not being worth your salt. Salt can't hang out with itself and make a difference. It's got to make contact with something different than itself. I want to close by telling you a story. There's more to this. I'll tell it very, very quickly. A while back, I became friends with a, a Muslim imam in Phoenix. And uh, 
been uh, in various settings with him and uh, traveled with him. Uh, he's very different than I am. And man, his values are different. Uh, he's, he's a really good guy and uh, I, I, I love the guy to death. Also became friends with um, an, uh, a rabbi in uh, Scottsdale. And it sounds like a setup for a joke because the story I want to tell you is about the time we invited my imam friend and his wife and my rabbi friend and his wife and Lisa and I, and we invited them over for dinner. And, and we, were, we were having dinner. It's really kind of ha hard to have dinner with people who are different because what you like might be something they can't eat and you have to kind of accommodate. But you know what? If you want to make friends and you want to build a relationship, you find a way. And, and so we kind of had an email trail going about, okay, what can, can you eat this? Can we, uh, how about we order this? Is this good? You know, all that. And so we found a meal. Yeah, in, the, in the middle of dinner, my imam friend uh, said, hey, can I go pray in your living room? Uh, because it's time, of, you know, they have the, the prayer call. So he goes into our living room and he basically needs to help being oriented to the east. And so I do that. And so we just let him do that. And we're all at the table. The, the, the oddest thing was, was that we have a guest that stays at our house most Wednesday nights. And this was on a Wednesday night. And I hadn't told him that we were doing this. And he came walking in the front door like he does every other time. And he walks in and and he walks into our dining room. And we're all sitting around the table. This is after the prayer. And, uh, you know, and we're laughing, having a great time. And I introduced him to my imam friend and his wife and my rabbi friend. And, and he, he, his, I could just see his mind was blown. He's a, he's a believer. And he, man, he just jumped in. And I'm telling you, we all had a ball that night. But, you know, even as I tell you that story, there are people who say you shouldn't be friends with an imam and you shouldn't be friends with a rabbi. And I just want to say, What? You see, this love beyond is not that provocative. It's, it, was never, it was just an application of what Jesus wanted us to do. And so, church, I just want to ask you, are you making friends with anybody who's different than you are? Are you making contact with anyone who's different? What does Saul have to do with any of this? It has everything to do with this. You're never going to make an impact if you're not willing to initiate contact. And we got to get out of the salt shaker and grit says we're not going to give up just because we're taking heat for doing the very thing that Jesus. No imam is ever going to come to Jesus because he got argued out of Islam and no rabbi is going to walk away because he got out debated. But you know how people change is they make friends with people and then truth prevails. Hey, I'm done. I'm going to pray. You know that whole light bulb thing that's going on in our church? You know what that's all about? It's about a commitment to be salt. That's what it's about. It's a commitment to be salt. If you haven't yet filled out a light bulb and if you've been thinking about other people you've been praying for and trying to find ways to positively build a relationship with them and talk to them about Jesus, take another bulb, man. Our boards are almost full in some campuses, so it's cool to watch. Write your name on one side, write their name on the other side, and then put that in that light board. It's a reminder and it's gonna stay in our church for a while. <clears throat> the, the mission was to be salt. That means we got to go out, not just collect in. And when you go out, um, you'll be amazed how many people will be not hostile, but welcoming if you'll just bring up the name of Jesus. And I encourage you to invite them to come in, invite them to join the, you know, the, the worship experience, but it doesn't need to be threatening. So let me close right now in prayer and and uh, great time to be with you. And again, I know the day is kind of odd, just the format of all of this is kind of weird, but we'll be back uh, in, in the normal rhythm next week. And I uh, look forward to being back with you. So let me pray and we'll be done. So God, thank you for the time that we got to be in your word just now. I pray that you help us to understand that we uh, can be very comfortable being with people who do everything and think everything the same way we do. And we're very alike. We're very much alike. But God, we're never going to make a difference just hanging out with people who, are, who we are like. We have to be willing to make contact with people who make us a little bit uncomfortable, who kind of set us a little bit on edge where we don't really know what to say. And sometimes we don't even know what to eat. And God, give us these kind of opportunities. Stretch our faith. God, help us to realize you're bigger than all of this. And we shouldn't be so afraid and fearful and intimidated. And God, uh, Lord, I pray for us as a church that we would not bow down to religious people who want to silence us from the idea of loving people. God, give us boldness and give us confidence to uh, live it out in Jesus' name. And we do this in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Amen. Thank you all for being here.